the healer had 9,999,999 points accumulated, and was just one point short of fulfilling his cherished wish to return back home to Earth. The guy was pondering this while sitting on the ground and looking at his status window. A girl with pink hair approached him and asked in an imperious tone why he was sitting idle. The healer got up from the ground, putting his backpack on his back, and apologized for the delay. He just wanted to see the rest of his mana. His legs were shaking and every step was difficult, but the rest of the team didn't care about him. The girl told the healer that they should have thought about the amount of mana earlier, but now it was time to go. The boy's load was very huge. His task in the group was the most important, but they treated him like a servant. He could heal other people's bodies from any wounds, but it was not appreciated in any way. And sometimes he was even called useless, although he saved the team from death more than once. The other members of the group shifted all the weight to him, while they remained light, with only their weapons in their hands. The young man came to this world as a high school student. Originally, in this new world, he was a copker, but he was forced to take the position of a healer, which he had been for seven years and still felt like a slave. However, if he collected 100,000 points, he could return back to his world and end the life of a servant. The three knights and the healer behind them walked down the narrow corridor of the cave until the leader ordered the others to stop. From the depths of the cave appeared the long legs of a giant spider. At the ends of the legs were spikes that with a light touch could cut flesh worse than a sword blade. The leader drew his sword and barely repelled the spider's attack. The second knight and the girl began to call out for Nergui, fearing for his life in the fight with the huge spider. The leader ordered the others to get into position. The subordinates drew their weapons and ordered the healer to stand farther away so he wouldn't get hit by the spider's attacks. The girl activated a spell and directed a fireball towards the monster. The spider was engulfed in flames, but it did not weaken, but grew even angrier. Its red eyes became an even bloodier shade, and it began to attack even more vigorously than before. Nergui tried to keep him in place by squeezing his paws with his shield. But the enemy was too large. The boy's face was bloodied, and seeing the spider's paw moving forward, ordered the others to be more careful. The girl didn't have time to dodge, and the claw pierced her stomach. Erisa fell to the ground, losing consciousness. The second knight threw two knives at the spider, but missed, and the blades hit the cave wall. The team retreated briefly to catch their breath after the battle, and the spider rushed back into the darkness, into its lair. Nergui put his hand on the healer's shoulder and ordered him to heal Arisa. The lad was surprised and said that if he treated such a serious wound, his mana would be used up quickly, and then he would be left with no strength at all. The leader shouted at his subordinate, asking if he was suggesting to leave the girl to die, and finally forced the healer to treat the wounded girl. The young man began to treat the girl, thinking about the fact that if he had been injured, the team would have left him here to die without a second thought. He finished the recovery spell and the girl regained consciousness, after which she lashed out at the guy since she heard that he refused to treat her. She started screaming about how he dared to suggest leaving her here to die and slapped her face, whereupon the guy fell to the ground in fear, covering his head with his hands. She stepped on his back, and the healer started apologizing and saying that his mana was practically running out. Nerg asked Arisa to stop hitting the healer, and she soon calmed down. Another team member said that if a monster stronger than that spider appeared, they would no longer be able to fight back, and asked the leader what they should do now. Nergui replied that moving further in that direction would be suicide, so they should retreat. The rest of the team agreed, and the group moved in the other direction. The healer walked behind and thought about the fact that he received no thanks, literally for saving a life. The second knight asked the leader to stop as he saw a treasure chest in the shadows of the corridor. They opened the lid of the chest, but inside were only a few pieces of leather that couldn't even be sold. They threw them on the ground and offered them to the healer to pick them up. The young man bent down to the rags and touching them, cried out in pain. The leader and subordinates turned back, thinking they were being attacked by a monster and saw that the healer was lying on the ground with his palms around his face. His face, eyes, and hands were hurting and he wanted to start self-medicating. However Nergui grabbed his hand and forbade him from doing so, saying they didn't have time to be here. He asked the guy to remove his hands to look at him, and saw nothing. The leader then suggested that the one was just bitten by some insect, but the guy kept arguing that he was in a lot of pain. The team didn't believe the servant, and started accusing him of hiding something from them. Nergui ordered everyone to calm down, and asked the healer if he could get to his feet. The guy replied that his head was still hurting badly, and then the leader started yelling at him to remember his place, and not to dare delay them. At that moment, the healer heard someone's voices in his head. 
A male voice said that the healer had taken damage from the trap set on the treasure chest. A female voice then chimed in, asking if this was too common for mere coincidences. The host replied that such a thing was impossible, and he, as the host, remained neutral. The girl then asked to continue the observation. The healer was startled, and heard a third voice suggest to the girl that she should start putting her points into the healer's skills. She was the healer's mistress, controlling him as a character. The girl replied to the mage saying that she felt terrible about this useless character, and didn't want to invest anything at all in its development. The host asked the gentleman if they wanted to roll the dice. The total of the two dice was the number three, it was a failure of the game, which meant the team had failed to escape the spider. The healer, after listening to his auditory hallucinations, began shouting to the others that the spider was running at them. Nergui and the rest of the team turned around, and saw that out of the darkness they were indeed being overtaken by a monster. They began to run with all their legs towards the rope bridge. Nergui and the others quickly ran across the bridge but the healer ran behind the others, not far from the spider. Anticipating that the monster would jump onto the bridge, the team cut the ropes, telling the guy one last time to help their team one last time. At that moment, the healer heard the men running them themselves reasoning that he was useless and decided to get rid of him. Like gods deciding the fates of men, he looked up at Nergui and with tears in his eyes, began to fall with the spider into the abyss. He was still alive. His bloody broken body lay motionless on the ground. Barely conscious, the healer found a small bat lying near him, which was also wounded. Apparently, she had fallen with him. From his last strength, he struck it twice with his fist to finish it off finally, and received one point for killing the dungeon dweller. It was the last point towards the 100,000 to return home. The system offered him two options for using the points, the first, returning to Earth, and the second, reviving the dead. The guy started crying again, and asked the system to send him home. The host was surprised that the healer he thought was dead had scored a hundred thousand points. Afterwards, he asked the lady if she wanted to receive the reward. The girl was also amazed that that stubborn man was still alive, and said that she had had enough. She called the healer a lowlife she was tired of bearing. The young man realized that he had heard that voice when he moved into this world, and then heard the announcer, after calling the girl a goddess, reply that they were ending the game for the day. The healer was desperate, angry, and hopeless. His 100,000 points had no effect on anything. He had not been brought back home, and now he was finally stuck in this world with no hope of returning home. He continued to lie on the ground with no strength, leaving his fist on the corpse of the bat, and called up the status window to inquire about his current characteristics. The panel said that he had been given the title of Freed from Fate. The guy channeled all his points into the best healing skill and reached the highest rank and title of Grand Master of Healing. He then activated the spell and channeled the great healing into his body. While his body was recovering, the healer, while still crying with pain and resentment, decided that he would not leave things as they were and would definitely avenge the fate he had received. Having fully recovered, the young man set out to wander the lower floors of the dungeon. He did not know how long he walked in the darkness, but after a while he found the corpse of a man. All that was left of the dead man was a skeleton lying on the ground and a spear that stood by the wall. Apologizing to the corpse, the healer took the spear as he had no other weapon. Suddenly, the guy saw a small spider crawling on the dead man's armor and immediately managed to grab it in his fist. Then he thought that if he didn't eat it, he would share the skeleton's fate, so he swallowed the spider. He heard the sound of dice being rolled on the numbers 2 and 3, a total of 5. It was a failure, after which he took damage from the venom of the small spider. The healer fell to the ground as the venom that spread through his body caused him pain, however, but still managed to stand and not lose consciousness. He decided not to stop and continue to think of spiders as food. He was able to catch another one and also swallow it, after which he took damage again. He continued to swallow one spider after another and taking damage from them instantly healed himself. Soon his body got used to the poison and began to produce antibodies, and the poison itself was absorbed into his body ability. He gained the new skill Poison Conductor, and now he himself could emit poison from his skin, poisoning anyone who dared to touch him. He spent an entire week in the dungeon eating spiders to raise his Poison Conductor level. All the while, he continued to hear the sound of dice being played and the voices of the gods. A huge butterfly with colorful wings flew down the corridor of the cave, but the guy didn't notice it as he was climbing up the wall to go to the floor above. With great difficulty, but he still managed to climb. On the new floor, the healer immediately saw a puddle of crystal clear water and ran to it, as he had been unable to find water for the previous week. 
He plunged his head into the puddle and swallowed greedily until he had quenched his thirst. At that moment a butterfly flew towards him, and the healer heard the sound of dice with the voice of the host announcing that it would now be decided whether or not he would dodge the attack. A total of seven fell out, signifying success, and the young man was able to dodge the monster's flight at the last moment. He fell to his knees, and on trembling limbs tried to rise, but the butterfly flew past him again. The guy then grabbed the spear from the ground, and opened the status window, and activated the attack skill. The characterization window then wrote that the timid coward had advanced to the brave fighter stage under the condition of being released from fate. He struck the butterfly's trunk with his spear and then killed it, gaining 37 points, and also received two extra points for bravery. Pulling out his spear, the healer splattered the monster's blood, and the characterization window reported that he had taken damage from the Mosrora's venom. He began cleansing his body of the toxins, and after gaining the poison art skill rank B then he realized that he could release poison during combat, which was a great advantage. He caught a lizard and roasted its meat and ate it near the underground river. A huge fish jumped out of the water and swallowed him, but he released poison and the monster was destroyed. After the remains disappeared, the guy found a small pink slime, which he named Lime, deciding to take him with him as a pet and assistant. For a long time now the healer and Lime had been wandering around, and soon the slime jumped off his master's head to show him a crevice in the wall that was hard to see. The young man thanked the little guy and entered a narrow corridor. This path was not like the others. While the entire dungeon looked like an abandoned cave, this place was paved with stones and patterns on the walls. The healer came to a dead end, an iron door that in no way wanted to open no matter how much he pushed it. Lime jumped off the guy's head again and climbed through the narrow gap of the locked door then opened it from the inside. The doors swung open and the healer stepped inside, calling his new friend an unusual slime. The baby began to tremble with fear, and the boy sensed that danger lay ahead of them. At the last moment he was able to dodge the monster's attack. It was a huge monster with several dozen tentacles and red eyes all over its body. The guy already wanted to run away from this place, but when he met Lime's gaze, he realized that he couldn't act like a coward anymore and had to protect his friend. He addressed himself by the name Lai Shido and asked himself how long could he run away. He activated his vigilante stage, and in a state of furious anger, demanded the monster to give his slime back, as he had managed to grab the baby. Lai Shido jumped above the ground just as several tentacles tried to grab him. He was very fast in the vigilante stage, and realized that the enemy's attacks were quite slow for him. He struck the monster with a piercing spear, but it was a failure and he couldn't do any damage. The monster's skin was too tough, and the sharp end of the spear was unable to pierce it. The healer heard the announcer's voice reporting that dice had been rolled to determine if an evasive maneuver would be made. The dice played for success, and Lai Shida was able to avoid the monster's new attack. Then he saw a purple flickering light, it was Lime showing his master the monster's vulnerable spot. The guy realized that it would be difficult for him to get through to that spot as the spear couldn't pierce its armor, so he then decided to activate poison all over his body to burn its flesh with acid. He got to the vulnerable spot and brought his hand up with the poison, managing to get inside the monster. However, at that moment, he heard the dice roll again to determine his evasion, and a loss fell out. The monster's tentacles touched him, and he took damage from the lone slime's poison. Lai Shido fell to his knees, bleeding, and activated his body purification. Finishing the great healing, he rose to his feet, ready for another battle. The healer channeled the poison onto his spear and performed a center piercing directly into the monster's core. The monster in turn began to secrete its venom, and the guy kept taking damage from it. The spear penetrated, but the metal began to melt, and then Shido applied a great healing, which also did additional damage on the monster. The lone slime was defeated, but the young man could only get one point for killing it. The monster's flesh vaporized and lime was freed. The boy wanted to rest and had already laid down on the ground, but the little guy started jumping towards the next room. Lee Shido followed him and found his little friend sitting on a treasure chest. They opened the chest and found stacks of papers inside. The papers contained a text written on behalf of Dr. Gepito, reporting that after the defeat of the war, he had tried to create a counterattack, but had failed. The stream of God's flesh over which he was conducting research overflowed and sealed the place. Therefore, he wrote that if someone managed to discover this place, he recommended using synthesized antibodies. The guy was amazed that it turns out that all this time, he could defeat that monster using antibodies. The gods continued to watch the game, and one of the men said he couldn't believe they were still able to watch the unthinkable and imaginable antics of that useless brat. The host in the Harlequino costume apologized, but the man replied that apologizing wouldn't change anything, 
Because 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 he was still alive, the new healer was dead. The dark-haired girl said that eventually there were three of them again. Arisa was telling her companions that she couldn't believe that the healer had managed to die so quickly before even getting to the entrance of the dungeon. They were in the forest, and had just slew an entire army of goblins. The knight asked the leader when they could go back to the village, but the girl desperately said that they couldn't retreat, after all they had been walking to this place for eleven whole days. The leader asked the male observer to give him one chance to show what he could prepare. The man resisted, as he didn't want to look at the pathetic healer anymore, but the swarthy girl said they could give him a chance. The third man asked what he would do after the knave's offer, warrior. At this point, Erisa asked Nergui what he would decide. Would they move back and retreat and return home? The fourth male god in charge of Nergui's actions said they would move forward. Nergui said that this dungeon was familiar enough to them, especially since they had prepared enough potions to survive with them, so there was no reason to retreat back. They went forward, and Lai Shido at this time replied to Lime that the artificially created dungeon by Dr. Gepito was one solid treasure trove for him, so he also went further down the corridors in search of chests and monsters to earn even more points. After a while, the young man came to a place where several pieces of leather were lying on the ground. It was at this place that he first heard the sounds of dice and the voices of those who controlled fate. This meant that he had come to the very place not far from where he had been thrown down. He had lived in the dungeon for 53 days before he reached this place. Memories of the moment his team had abandoned him made him homesick, but the lad quickly pulled himself together and continued on his way, knowing that ahead of him awaited the giant spider they had never been able to kill. He picked up the spear he had obtained from Dr. Gepito's treasury and stood in front of the spider that had descended from the web. The spider was the boss of the dungeon called White Tyrant. Lai Shido activated the spear flurry skill and struck the spider's head repeatedly. The one taking damage jumped aside in an attempt to save. The monster then struck the young man, and he dropped his spear, falling to the ground. The spider then began biting the healer, and striking him with its claws on the ends of its paws. The young man screamed, bleeding in an incredible pain, but then applied great healing, telling the spider that he wasn't done fighting yet. Healed, he rose to his feet, and seeing the bewilderment in the spider's red eyes, told him that he would not get an easy victory. The spider continued to attack the guy, and the guy tried to dodge and deflect the attacks with his spear. It then tried to attack him with the spearhead, but experienced failure each time. The monster opened its jaws and started attacking the guy, trying to devour him, and while the guy was running away, the monster was able to put him on the end of one of its paws. The guy's chest was punctured by the claw and he was hanging in the air, spitting blood out of his mouth. From his last strength, he said that no matter how strong a monster he was, eyes were the weak point of every creature. The healer struck the spider's eyes with his spear and had his first success in battle. While the spider was thrashing around in agony, letting go of its victim, Lai Shido immediately applied great healing. While he was thinking that he would now need to keep aiming for the eyes, the monster wrapped its web around his leg. The young man tried to shred the web with his spear, but it grew larger and larger until it covered him in a dense cocoon. The spider engulfed him inside itself, and then the healer used the power of the conductor, and began to secrete the poison with his whole body. The acid of the poison began to burn the spider from the inside out, and eventually it was torn apart. The monster's flesh and cocoon dissolved in the poison, and Lai Shido was able to climb out. His skin became swarthier as it was burned due to the huge amount of poison, and it took about two days to recover, the status window reported this. After defeating the spider, he was able to climb out of the dungeon, and finally, after a few dozen days, see the sunlight. He enjoyed the fresh air and the sound of leaves and grass, then he raised both his hands up and shouted that he was finally able to get out of the dungeon. At this moment, Nergui and his team approached him, and asked him who he was and how did he end up in this place. Lai Shido realized that because of the side effect of the secreted poison, his former team couldn't recognize him. He told Nergui that he had gone to the dungeon with his team a couple days ago, but everyone had died, and he was the only one who could return. The knight then told him to leave and went to the entrance of the dungeon he couldn't get through last time. Why Shido stopped the guy and asked him to take him with him since he was a healer. The team agreed and everyone moved on their way. Nergui could easily kill two Mosra butterflies and the healer noticed that he could now notice all of the warrior's actions quite easily, something he couldn't do before. As they were walking through the cave, a corpse wasp appeared on the rascal's neck, a sting that caused paralysis for two days. The goddess was surprised that the host offered to roll dice to determine whether or not the insect would sting him, but afterward realized that apparently her ward was giving slack. The boy had been stung by a wasp, and Nergai ordered a healer to treat him. 
the young man said the wounded man was not breathing and was probably dead, so he should be buried. Arisa refused to bury their comrade in the cave, and the leader ordered them to strip the dead man of his equipment and move on with their journey. The rascal tried to inform his friends that he was alive and not dead at all, but they left him to it. They came to a rope bridge, and the leader asked Shido if he knew the way down. The healer guided the two warriors down the path, and when Arisa hit a rock with her heel and almost fell into the abyss, he managed to grab her shoulder in time. Afterward he said that it would have been more convenient if the bridge had not been broken, and at that moment Nergui attacked him with his sword, asking how he knew that the bridge had been broken. The effects of the poison wore off, and Lai Shido got his skin color back, as well as the spell of his unrecognizability sleeping. Arisa and Nergui recognized the healer they had thrown into the abyss along with the spider 59 days ago. Lai Shido touched Arisa's neck with his hand and applied a paralyzing poison. The girl froze in place, unable to move. He then said that he was no longer the same as before and was going to take revenge on them. He unleashed a flurry of spears at Nergui's sword, and it split into pieces. The leader of the group was amazed that the pitiful healer had become so strong. The watchers asked the leader if he had decided to play a joke on them like that, but the leader didn't know what to say. Then the warrior manager asked the host to put all the points he had collected into a weapon for his ward. From the empty space, a large hammer suddenly appeared, glittering with golden lightning. Nergui's status window announced that it was a gift given to him from his sacred patron. Nergui took the hammer in his hands and said that he received it he his sacred patron. Lai Shido thought about the fact that the warrior was only a pawn in the hands of this patron. Nothing more. The knight began to attack the healer. The one tried to chop the young with his poison spear, but the poison had no effect on the sacred weapon. Nergui began to shoot lightning bolts at the healer, and he fell to the ground bleeding. He recognized the weapon as a Mjolnir, a divine hammer from Scandinavian mythology, and then his theory that the patrons were gods was confirmed. Lime leapt from his master's shoulder and landed on his enemy's face. It turned out to be a poisonous slime, which began to poison Nergui's skin. The latter ripped it off his face and clenched it in his fist. Out of rage, Lai Shido activated the vigilante stage again, which boosted his abilities a few points higher. The knight was amazed that he was willing to part with his life for some slime, but the guy replied that it was a member of his team. The host suggested the god roll the dice one last time, and those fell with the success of the battle winning towards Nergui. Shido swung his fist at his opponent's face, and the latter aimed his hammer at his side to strike his head. At this point, the healer had a new ability. He could throw the dice himself to decide the outcome of his fate. The dice fell with success in his direction, and time stood still. Nergui froze in flight, and Lai Shido was able to move slightly to the side to prevent the hammer from hitting him, and then channeled the poison into his fist. Then time flowed again, and he punched the knight in the face. The poison poisoned him, and he fell powerless to the ground. Shido then decided to do to him as he had done to him last time. He threw the warrior into the abyss beneath the broken bridge. The warrior's patron god was angry and would not accept the loss, wanting to take revenge on the healer, while the dark-haired girl, the patron god of the trickster, was extremely interested in the process. The host began to apologize for what had happened, not realizing what kind of mistake could have occurred in the system. Lee Shido approached Arisa, but she began to ask him not to touch her. He did not go near her, and said that the paralyzing poison would wear off in an hour, and maybe she would be lucky to survive in this dungeon, which was still full of spiders and other monsters. He walked out of the dungeon, leaving the girl alone defenseless, and ran into a guy and a girl who were brother and sister in the forest. They were holding a bound man in a wagon with a gag in his mouth. The girl caught sight of the healer and said that luck was on her side today. Lai Shido was surprised to meet people in this place. The girl was going to steal from him, but the boy told her in her ear that he was poorly dressed, so it was unlikely to get anything from him. Nevertheless, she insisted and offered the traveler a ride in their wagon. The healer replied that he wouldn't mind, but he had other things to do. In fact, he was wary of them and was not about to get into a wagon with strangers. At that moment, he heard the sound of dice being played for his chance to escape the surprise attack. He turned around sharply and found that the girl was about to cast a paralyzing poison on him, and so he activated the anti-paralysis barrier just in time. The girl got angry and began to cast every poison and spell she knew on him. The man asked his sister to stop, as she could dissolve all the items they received, but the girl herself was soon exhausted as she lost a lot of strength. Lai Shido gained a new ability, resistance to a hundred kinds of poisons. Now it was his turn to attack, and he struck his poison-soaked fist at his enemy to show her how poison should really be applied. 
The girl took on her natural appearance and her ears appeared to be pointy, she was an elf. The girl asked the guy how he had gotten such power, and the guy replied that he had just gained a lot of experience since he had been in this world for seven whole years. He was surprised that all the elves were so aggressive, and having put a paralyzing poison on the pair, got into their wagon, saying that he would dispose of it and the money lying in it properly, after which he left, warning the thieves not to dare to rob anyone again. The young man arrived at the village, glad that at last he would be able to eat a proper meal, but found that the people were very unfriendly, and were careful not to leave their houses. After an hour, the effects of the poison wore off and the pair were finally able to stand up. The elfess told her partner, calling him by the name of Jiang Ming, that they should follow that guy's trail and retrieve their belongings from him. At that moment, a young man approached them, surprised to meet the famous witch of Yada Kona. She turned to the traveler, angrily asking who it was. It turned out to be the fallen summoner Dong Jun, a warrior who killed summoners from other worlds. He was very dangerous, and even the sight of him could be frightening. He had long white hair hidden under a hood, a red mark on his face, and a spear that he used to kill people with. He asked the elfess who she was able to take such damage from but she said it was none of his business. Then he offered to take over her education and put the end of the spear to the girl's throat. Jiang Ming asked the thug to stop and said that they had just seen a recent summoner who had been in this world for seven whole years and most likely had accumulated a lot of points that could be obtained by killing him. Such news pleased Dong Jun and asked where that person was now. Lai Shido had changed into his new clothes and was having dinner at the tavern, happy that he was now finally clean and fed. He watched the people and found that he could see their titles above each of them, signifying their abilities. Apparently he could now see the characterization of each summoned, in addition to being able to hear the dialogues of the gods. From the discussions of the men at neighboring tables, he learned that there was a pestilence in the village, and now he understood why the people were surly and hiding in their homes. The men were discussing what hope the source of the disease could destroy the order that would be arriving the other day. The boy, having finished eating, told Lime that he needed to leave the village soon before the order could get here, though he wanted to spend the night in a soft bed. He got into the wagon to leave, but suddenly saw a spear flying in his direction. The spear grazed the horse's head and crashed into the wooden cart. Dong Jun was surprised that his victim was able to dodge his spear. He took off his hood, revealing his face to Lai Shido. The latter immediately recognized him as a fallen summoner, as the red tattoo was more than just a mark. Each pattern signified a slain person. The tattoo was half of his face, which meant the guy had killed a lot of people. The healer told the thug that he had spent all his accumulated points, so there was no point in the guy attacking him. But Dong Jun said he would test his fame for truthfulness after he killed him. He tried to land several blows with the spear he had pulled out of the cart beforehand, but Lai Shido dodged the blows every time. He then touched his opponent's neck and applied a special poison that destroyed nerve cells. The fallen summon instantly fell to the ground and died. Since the horse was killed, the guy couldn't leave, and to hide from the order, he climbed the wall of the fortress that was built around the settlement. His personality level was full, and then he realized that if he acted in a way that didn't fit logic and reality in the god's view, his personality skills would increase. On the wall, he saw that many people in light robes with staffs in their hands were pandering below. It was the order that had come to purify the village of the disease. The gods gathered in the hall for the game and began to ask the host when they would begin. From their noisy dialogue, Lai Shido learned that they had created the epidemic for content. An interesting spectacle, this meant that human life meant nothing to them. The members of the order were uncomfortable with the fact that they had built a wall around the village to keep the virus from spreading, yet they hadn't evacuated the healthy people, leaving them in a confined space with the sick. It was all just an entertaining game of the gods. The healer walked forward along the wall and saw a little girl. She was lying there with no strength, and her body was covered in black spots. The boy lifted her up in his arms, and in a weak voice she began to beg him to help her mother. He began to absorb her sickness, which was called Black Death. The spots began to come off the girl's body, traveling to the healer's skin. Soon she was completely rid of the disease, and came to her senses, surprised that she was healthy. The young man fell to his knees, a stream of blood pouring from his mouth. He told the girl that he was fine and she should not touch him in any way. The healer wanted to begin the cleansing, but the status window reported that the disease was a rank higher, causing him to summon a great healing spell. He began to glow with a white light, after which he eliminated the disease in him, absorbing it into himself and becoming immune to it. The girl thought that the person in front of her was a saint, as no one could defeat the Black Death. 
Lai Shido himself thought that it had been a long time since he had absorbed such an abominable stuff that was much worse than the other poisons he had absorbed. Lai Shido was about to leave the village, but the girl grabbed him by his clothes and asked him to cure her mother. Because of the halo, an energy ring behind the back of the healer's head that appeared when he absorbed a large amount of poison. The girl mistook him for a saint, thinking it was a halo over his head. The boy didn't want to get involved with the order, however the status window announced a mission for him. There was a main boss to defeat, and a sub-assignment to heal 376 villagers. He had 375 more people to heal, since the girl was included in the score, and he would get 3 points for each resident he saved, as well as the boss's power getting weaker at the same time. The healer decided he could use that many points, and taking the girl's hand, told her to walk him to her mom. The woman was lying in bed and her condition was critical. She told her daughter that she had asked her not to go out, but the girl said she had brought a saint. The mother did not understand anything, but the next moment the young man's hand touched her head and instantly neutralized the illness. Afterward, the young man asked the girl to gather all the other villagers. The gods were very displeased that an uninvited guest who was not under their control had dared to intercept the priest's sub-assignment, as he was thus violating the entire content. They decided to reclaim the assignment for themselves and began to run the order like puppets in a play. The girl priest told her group that she couldn't just watch people die, and if the others were afraid to go to the village, she would go alone and heal everyone. The commander forbade her to do so, saying he couldn't let her go alone. At this time, Lai Shido healed the last 376th villager. The sub-assignment was completed and the boss received lethal damage. A skeleton spellcaster called Lick appeared on the people to destroy them. The leader of the Order's team clashed with him in a fight, and since the latter was weakened due to the damage he had taken while eliminating the disease, the priest quickly destroyed him. A red ball rolled from the pile of bones, the lick's core. The girl priest asked her leader hands what he was going to do, as he froze with the core in his hands instead of immediately smashing it. The boy's eyes turned red and his look became embittered. He asked Yun Ha if she knew the legend of the Death Knight. The girl didn't answer, and asked back what was happening to the guy and then she saw that he had swallowed the core. One of the gods was outraged by this course of events, but the patronizing hands replied that this way the game became more interesting, because that was the nature of his character. Knight was a true hypocrite. He became a high-ranking member of the sacred society, and followed the legend of the Death Knight to gain even more power. It was very intriguing and the patronizing god was hoping to win. The host rolled the dice, and they played to lose. Hands couldn't take the power of the Lick's core and died instantly. The patron experienced annoyance, but quickly forgot about his ward, believing he could summon someone else in the future. The other god then decided to play big and direct the battle to turn the tide, while summoning an uninvited guest into the arena. Lai Shido, after curing all the people, told them to go to their homes, and afterwards, believing that the boss had been destroyed, also wanted to leave the village. Yun Ha sat beside her dead friend and hoped that he was alive by applying her staff's healing spells on him. However, it didn't work, and Lick's spirit had taken over the corpse under its influence. The Lick was a necromancer mage. Han's body turned into a skeleton that possessed magical power. Yun Ha tried to destroy the monster with her power, but her spells were weak and couldn't do any damage. Then Lick summoned an army of undead, and the gods offered Lee Shido to fight the boss and gave him a new sub-assignment to protect 376 villagers for each of whom he would receive 10 points. The healer sprinted to the monster, and despite Yun Ha asking him to stay away, as the Order's second squad led by the head priest Pierre was about to arrive, moved forward. He activated the great healing spell, and expanding its radius, instantly struck the lick and all the undead with light energy, which was destroyed without a trace in a second. The gods were shocked that which of their colleagues could deny such a strong summoner. Yun Ha couldn't believe her eyes, after all, Great healing was the highest sacred spell that almost no one possessed. At this moment, Pierre's squad arrived and arrested Lai Shido for calling himself a saint, which was illegal. Shun Yun Ha tried to stop Pierre, explaining to him that he had cured all the people and defeated the Lick. But the priest was relentless and strictly enforced the law. He wasn't going to find out the details of Han's death right away, and believing that Lai Shido had killed him, took him captive to be interrogated afterward. A crowd of people gathered in the square and began to beg Pierre not to punish the saint. To be in an advantageous position, Lai Shido summoned a halo like a halo over his head and said that he was a secret inspector sent by the Holy Virgin. Upon seeing his affiliation with the saints, people fell to their knees and began to pray to him. The healer noticed in the crowd an elven girl and her accomplice, who, despite the situation, 
came to take revenge on him. To gain the trust of the order, the boy decided to give them the thief, and using the power of poisons, took off her human disguise. He told Pierre that on his way here on a mission for the saint, he had discovered this stranger, who turned out to be an elf stealing from people with his accomplice. Pierre recognized her as the witch of Cana Poison, and ordered his soldiers to arrest her, after which he began to apologize to Lee Guido for his accusations, and thanked him for catching the witch. The healer then said that Hans died helping him in the battle against Lick, and died as a hero. Yun Ha looked at Lai Shido, and he quietly told her that it was better not to say that he Hans was the culprit behind the Lick's revival, or else the Order of Saints would lose the trust of the people, and the girl obeyed him, marveling at his wisdom. The gods observed the uninvited guest's lies, asking the host if he was acting according to some script, but the host replied that he was completely making up the course of further history. After this incident, Lai Shido told the order that he would be traveling to fulfill further errands for the Holy Maiden, and left for an alchemy city called Flatbees. On the way, he told Lime that he hoped that at least in this city he would be able to sleep in a soft bed. They arrived in the city in the afternoon, and immediately decided to do a little business, after which they planned to go rest. Lai Shido went to the alchemist's shop, and gave the master a bottle containing antibodies to poisons to study the properties of the potion and quote a price for it. But the man replied that he did not even know the poisons against which this elixir worked, and suggested that the young man go to another shop further down the street, as there was a master there who was more knowledgeable in poisons. The boy thanked the shopkeeper, and went to the next shop. It was empty, and he went inside to look around. The room was pitch black, and the healer was about to summon a halo to light his way, until he saw that Lime had activated his own small halo. Lai Shido was surprised at how his little friend could replicate his abilities. The rascal goddess called them an interesting pair, and told the boy that she knew he could hear her. There was no game going on between the gods at the moment, and she came to see him in person. She stood beside him, but her body belonged to another dimension, so he was unable to see her. He wanted to chase the goddess away, but she offered him a contract to participate in the games on her behalf, and in return she would give him points and help him find the goddess he wanted to take revenge on for leaving him. And if he didn't agree to this offer, the trickster could then tell the other gods about his ability to hear them, and then he would get a lot of trouble from them. Pluth asked the guy, had he already forgotten the goddess who had called him to this world and then abandoned him? Lai Shido remembered his revenge and realized that a contract with Rascal would be the best option to get to the traitor. The girl hugged the guy, but he couldn't see her and said she could justify his trust. If she dared betray him, she would tell the rest of the gods that he had heard her voice. The young man didn't see how that could hurt her, and the goddess explained that he was the mistake of the game. And if everyone found out that she was withholding information about what he could and could hear, the supreme deity would immediately kill her. The healer agreed to the contract, but before signing it, he asked the goddess her name. The girl replied that she couldn't use her real name, and asked to continue calling her Rascal. She said she had to summon the game's host, as it was impossible to register the summoner without him. The healer asked the Patronus if it wouldn't be dangerous if someone else found out about his secret. But the girl replied that the host was a trustworthy person who didn't reveal the secrets of the gods. The host in the Harlequino mask appeared in front of Rascal, and asked her what she needed. She asked to register the summoned Lai Shido for her patronage, and reminded the host that this was her plan for the game's plot development, as this person could hear them. The host became frightened, telling the girl that if the Supreme God found out about it, he would kill them immediately, and then Lai Shido told him out loud not to worry as he was willing to help him develop the game. He then reminded him that they were already in the same boat, as the outcome in his favor had greatly angered the warrior, who was unwilling to accept losing. Remembering that incident, the host agreed to the proposed venture, as he was afraid of the warrior's revenge and what he could do to him. At the conclusion of the contract, Harlequin gnawed his thumb nervously, and left in confusion and fear. As the healer walked towards the tavern, Rascal laughed, telling her new ward that it was a shame he couldn't see the host's face and how scared he was. The girl couldn't hear the boy's thoughts, and could only speak to him if he answered her out loud. Knowing that his thoughts were safe, he breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that despite the contract, he couldn't completely trust Rascal, and he had an advantage against her, since she didn't know that he could also hear the sounds of the dice, and could change their roles in his favor. The young man sat down at a table and asked the waitress for a kebab and something to drink. As he began to eat, the gods began to gather for a new game. 
two men came who were not happy about the presence of the demigod, whom they considered a filthy brat unworthy to be at the same table with them, the purebloods. The healer realized that the half-breed was Plutus, as he heard her ask the men if her presence hurt them that much. After overhearing the god's dialogue, Lai Shido began to listen to the gossip from the neighboring tables. There were knights sitting at one of the tables who were discussing that a former famous mage worked in this tavern. People were saying that this girl had gone crazy and lost her magic, however her face was pretty. They were going to meet this crazy girl, and Lai Shido assumed that they were the summoners of those gods who spoke ill of Rascal. He picked up a dish from the table, and walked over to the guys and punched one of them in the face. The one jumped up, and asked the healer what he was doing, and the young man replied not to spread noise and gossip. Rascal was surprised, and covered her mouth, waiting to see what her ward would do next. The people in the tavern stared at the boys, realizing that those sitting at the table were the villains, and the one who had hit them had decided to block their way. The guys stood up and challenged Lai Shido to a fight, and the latter, activating the vigilante stage, told them to attack if they were brave enough to do so. Lai Shido easily punched the first person who attacked him with his sword in the face, and then two more. Two of them were unconscious, but the last one continued to stand on his feet. Then the healer paralyzed him with poison and said that he didn't even need a weapon to defeat him, and then slapped him in the face once more, ordering them to clean up the tavern, and put back all the furniture that had fallen during their fight, and if they slacked off, they would get more. The boys got scared, and started to clean up. The gods were angry, and asked Pluta if she had ordered her ward to attack their summoners, but the girl replied in a sweet tone that it was just that her summoner had a vengeful temper, and those settings could not be changed. The deities left, not wanting to talk to the girl anymore. As Lai Shido walked back to his table, the other visitors thanked him for teaching those trespassers who were disturbing their rest. He replied that he didn't need any thanks, and then noticed that a red-haired girl was eating his kebab. He told her it was his food, at which point the tavern worker ran up to her, saying that she had asked her not to leave the room. She began apologizing to the healer, explaining that the girl had dementia. The guy replied that there was nothing wrong, and afterwards asked the landlady to give him a room, as he had nowhere else to sleep. The woman said that there was a second room on the second floor and added that she would give a discount for paying for it because of the incident. The boy thanked the landlady, and went up to the bedroom to rest. When he saw the redhead, he heard the voice of Rascal, who was surprised by the appearance of this girl, so he wanted to talk to her. The goddess asked the guy, did he really want to protect her with his fighting antics? Lai Shido replied that it was, and afterward asked if she was really a demigod. The girl said that they were gods, called players, and those players were in their world. Shido replied that he assumed they belonged to different mythologies. The girl confirmed his guess, and then said that it was hard to attribute her origins to any mythology, and it was questionable to give her the title of a god. She could tell him nothing more about her identity, and began to talk about the girl they had encountered on the first floor. She was a summon whose player had disappeared. On the basis of what happened, when the patron controlling her destiny disappeared, she lost her mind due to shock. This was an isolated incident, and summoned ones never went insane if they were disowned by the gods. No one knew what happened to this player, and it was only assumed that his disappearance happened at the moment of descending. But even this information was inaccurate, however, it was the only explanation for the girl's loss of sanity. Lai Shido asked what a dissension was, and Rascal replied that it was the name of the process where the player possessed the body of the summon to descend into their world. The lad had never heard of such a method, and the girl said that descending was a great enhancement to logicality, but one had to be prepared to disappear so the gods did not perform this action. Logicality explained the limits of actions, and the more unrealistic the act, the greater the importance of personality. Shido lay down on the bed, and asked, wasn't reaching the maximum before disappearing equal to putting your life on the line in the game? Rascal replied that it was exactly like that, and once the logic level reached 100, everyone would disappear. Hearing this, the guy thought that since the dice increased the logic level, he should be more careful next time. Shido then said goodbye to Rascal, and went to bed. In the evening, a squad of the Order of Priests came to the tavern. Their leader asked the hostess to summon the girl who had descended, as he must retrieve her by order of the Holy Maiden. The woman summoned Ri and told her that she must go with the order. Two months later, Lai Shido was walking through the cave in the same team with three other summoned ones. The blonde-haired leader, with an earring in his ear and a scar on his face told the others that they should take a break, as the door they were standing in front of was the last one in the dungeon. The leader of the squad was a tracker, 
he was responsible for neutralizing the traps in the dungeons. Everyone agreed with the boy, so they took a break. Lee Shido had become a copker, so the team took a very young boy who was still gaining experience as a healer. He asked Shido if he could rest, and he allowed him to sleep for a while, and wake him up when they moved on. One goddess, who was watching, told Rascal that her summoner had been very caring to her ward. The second goddess said that it was because he himself had held the position before, so he understood how difficult it could be for him. The young man went to bed, and the spearmen and tankards sat down against the wall to let their muscles rest. The ranger offered them a portion of dried meat, and seeing that the healer was asleep, decided to split his portion between the three of them as well. Shido didn't appreciate his companion's sneaky act, and decided not to eat his entire portion so he could share it with the healer. It had been two months since he and his team had been mopping up the dungeons, and he had managed to gain 10,000 points in that time. His team was reliable, and he was glad to have joined them. However, the Pathfinder player suddenly said that the meat was poisoned with fly poison, and his charge was actually a fallen summoner. He rolled the dice to decide whether the team members would be poisoned by the meat or not. Upon hearing this, Shido told the girl as a tankard to stop eating meat. This act turned the tide, and the dice drank on the losing side. The effects of the poison had no effect, and the former healer struck the tracker with his spear, cutting his throat. Tanker asked if the man wanted to kill them, and then Lai Shido showed her the red pattern tattoo on his neck that was hidden under the collar of his jacket. It was the mark of a fallen summoned one. The player in charge began to ask Rascal how her charge was able to determine that the meat was poisoned. The girl explained that Shido had the ability to habituate to a hundred kinds of poison, and identifying such a simple poison was easy for him. The god became angry and left the canal, no longer wishing to observe what was happening. Tanker realized that Shido had protected them, and was surprised that there was a traitor in their squad. Afterward, she asked what they should do, and the lanceman suggested not to tell the healer when he woke up that the tracker was a fallen, but to say that he was trapped, since it was too early for him to know such brutal details. The girl told the boy that he had been very kind, and hugged him. The goddess in charge of the tankard began to marvel at this picture, and said that it appeared that her ward had fallen in love with the co-pilot. Rascal also enjoyed watching the romantic scene in the dungeon, and the guy thought that the goddess was not helping him at all with such actions. At that moment the healer woke up, and asked the older man what happened to the pathfinder. The boy replied that their comrade had fallen into a trap and died. The boy began to cry, as he could not help his friend and heal him. But the hen began to comfort him, reassuring him that he was not guilty of anything and should move on so that their friend's death would not be in vain. The boy wiped away his tears and the team moved forward, out the last door. The inside was empty, and the group walked quite a distance until they saw a huge golem against the wall. The monster awoke and began to charge at the bottom. Tanker ran forward, shouting to a copeman to help her from behind. She tried to destroy the monster by moving to ram but she couldn't do any damage. Then Lai Shido started hitting the weak points, the knees and elbows, with his spear. The monster's limbs fell apart and immediately put back together. At the moment of the battle, the former healer saw a slit in the monster's back, from which a red light could be seen. He immediately realized that it was the golem's core, and that was where he needed to strike to defeat it. The tank called Lai Shido well done, and began distracting the golem by hitting its arms with her club. While the monster was fighting her, the spearman struck the monster's back with his spear, after which a core in the form of a red ball fell out of there. The golem immediately stopped, and the girl didn't realize why until the guy told her that he had already retrieved the core. The girl wondered how her comrade could find the enemy's weak spot so quickly, and felt annoyed as she herself only attacked from the front. After completing the dungeon, the whole team decided to return to the settlement and rest, as they couldn't find any chests, and they needed to find a new teammate for further forays. The host announced the end of the game and all three goddesses enjoyed playing it. The girls enjoyed playing together and wanted to continue on in the future. Rascal said that they needed a fourth player, and she knew who to invite. Hearing this Lai Shido was excited to see what his patroness was up to. The team sat down at the tavern to eat. At that moment, Rascal greeted a player named Healer. This was the same goddess who had summoned Lai Shido into this world and then abandoned him. The guy was shocked when he heard her voice. A knight, a young youth with long white hair and a mole near his eye, approached them. He asked them if they needed a fourth member of the team. It was the Healer's new ward, a two-handed knight. She congratulated Rascal on acquiring the Lanceman and suggested the rest of the girls work together. Shido motioned for the guy to sit down with them, and Tank was struck by the guy's beauty. He 
He introduced himself as Chris and said he was a two-handed swordsman, but could also stand in tank and support positions. His titles were Luck of the New Recruit, Aristocrat's Curse, and Cocky Blade. Tanker asked the newcomer how long he had been in this world and placed a hand on his shoulder. Player Healer was angry that her colleague driving her tank allowed such a gesture, as she was jealous of her ward, and told the others that only she could touch him. The girl apologized and said she wouldn't do it again. Chris replied to the tank that he came here about five months ago and took her hand off his shoulder. Shido said that you couldn't tell that from his appearance and equipment, and he looked like an experienced knight. The guy then replied that he got his armor and weapons thanks to his sacred Patronus. Why Shido was astonished that that goddess had given him such things, while he hadn't even been remembered in their seven years together, and now, watching him, didn't recognize him, and also didn't understand at what point she became so angry as she snapped at the other players. Chris then said that he loved his Patronus very much, and fights for her. The healer confirmed that she often hugged him and kissed him, working soul to soul with him. After the tavern, the team went straight to the next dungeon. Chris told the healer to keep up with them, and the boy became nervous that he might let the whole group down. The player in charge of the boy asked her colleague why she was making such a push on her charge. The blonde replied that healers should always be treated that way, because in essence, healers became those who did not have outstanding talents and abilities, and thus were useless. Shido thought about how this goddess had become like the other players and warriors who treated healers like slaves and began to think of a plan to get back at her with Chris's help. Ahead of them were lizard men and quicksand. Two-handed shouted to the others that he could handle the monsters and ran forward, but got stuck in the abyss and began to slowly slide down into the depths of the sands as the lizard men advanced on him. Why Shido realized that Chris was a weakling and rushed to save him. He unleashed a flurry of spears and instantly killed three lizard men, before reaching out with his two-handed weapon and pulling him out of the quicksand. The man apologized for his oversight, and the leader ordered him to take on the lizardman on his right side while he fought with his left. Two-handed experienced failure and was unable to kill a single monster. One of the goddesses told Chris's patronus that she had praised her ward in vain, for he was useless. The girl was indignant and replied that he had fought quite well for a summon five months ago. Tank ran to the two-handed man's aid and killed all the lizards, then began to berate him because he wasn't following the captain's orders. The fight ended and Lee Shido asked the tank to stop swearing since he had already reprimanded Chris. The healer saw a chest up ahead, and Chris immediately ran forward, telling the others that he would open it. Tank was once again displeased that the newcomer was acting on his own without negotiating anything with their leader. Why Shido thought to himself that the two-armed man was very stupid, as he couldn't even tell the difference between the real chest and the leader's trap. After opening the box, the guy activated the trap, a sand funnel. He began to fall down, and Shido decided that this was his chance to use his revenge plan against the goddess that betrayed him. He jumped into the funnel following Chris and grabbed his arm to pull him out but they were unable to get out and fell to the lower floors of the dungeon. Chris started to cry, but Shido told him that he had been in this kind of trouble before, so they would be able to get out. The most important thing was not to be discouraged. The host informed the players that the plot of the game was changing, and now the team was divided into two. The goddesses, who patronized the healer and the tank, decided to go to the beginning of the dungeon and find another passage to help the others. Tank began to calm the boy, who began to cry, and said that they would be able to find the captain and everything would be all right. Eight days had passed since then. Chris had gotten quite weak and couldn't walk on his own feet, so Lai Shido had to carry him on his shoulders. Two-handed began to apologize that his Patronus's protection had blinded him, and he had been selfish, but now he had an epiphany and wanted to work for the sake of the team. The spearman told him that he had found them food, and the lad rather wanted to see what edible the man had to offer him. It was spiders. The goddess was angry that the copeman was offering her summoner to eat spiders and forbade Chris from accepting them from him. Shido, on the other hand, said they were not poisonous, but one must endure the unpleasant taste, and then threw one spider into his mouth. The blonde continued to be indignant and tried to control the actions of the two-armed man, but he heeded the leader's advice and not wanting to continue to be a burden, asked for one spider for himself to eat. Lee Shido and Chris had already been wandering around the dungeon for 11 days. Two-handed asked the captain to give him another spider. He was no longer squeamish of such food and was beginning to get used to the bitter taste. Shido slowly fed him the spiders, amazed at how he was changing and becoming a more resilient spirit. He relinquished his portion and handed it to the warrior. The goddess continued to get annoyed every time her precious Chris ate such crap. 
Suddenly, the announcer announced that a salamander, a huge lizard that lived in the lava, was ahead of the travelers. Pris asked the captain if the monster's meat was edible. The lad replied that they would find out when they killed it, and the two-armed man ran forward to slay the monster. She did her best to strike, and eventually the lizard's skin sliced and thick and hot blood spurted in different directions. Rascal told the healer that the salamander emitted lava instead of blood, and the latter had sent her ward to fight her with swords in vain. The girl began screaming back that she hadn't been warned in advance. Shido rescued Chris from the lava flows and delivered a precise blow with his spear straight to the head. The salamander immediately died, and the two-handed man asked the captain how he was able to defeat the monster. The young man explained that such monsters could not be killed with mere weapons, and his spear was sacred. Chris lost his swords in the battle, they disintegrated in the lava. No sooner had the guys stepped aside than suddenly, a second even bigger monster appeared, a steel half-dragon whose scales were poisonous. Shido jumped aside with his comrade and asked him to stand aside, as he had no weapons, and promised him that he could handle the battle himself. The huge lizard emitted streams of lava from its mouth, and the spearman realized that it was impossible to get close to it which meant that he had to attack from a long distance. At that moment, he wished his former Patronus could see what he was capable of and regret having disowned him. He summoned a poison spear, an ability where he could transform y'all into spears. He struck the short green-colored spear at the monster, and with the help of the status window, he learned that this power was enough for six more spears. He struck directly at the head of the serpent, and the serpent began to fall. At that moment, Chris approached the leader to help him, but the falling serpent grazed his shoulder with its fangs in its open mouth. Shido received 372 points for killing the steel half-dragon, but he didn't care about that as his comrade was bleeding. Chris fell to the ground and felt like he was dying. Why Shido asked him why he had gotten into the fight since he had asked him to stay away, but the young man replied that he couldn't stand by and wished to help him. Then the former healer realized that Chris had really changed in the eleven days they had spent together, and his patroness was no longer influencing him with her arrogance. Chris said he was indebted to the captain, and was grateful to him for trying to protect them to the end. Why Shido saw that Chris's title settings had changed. His skill panel now looked like this, title luck of the new recruit, aristocrat's curse, and devotee of devotion. The goddess asked the presenter where to do her ward's ability self-confident blade. The host said that the character's settings had changed the moment he got hit by he monster. The girl then demanded to change the settings back, but the manager replied that it was impossible because she didn't have enough points to do so. Chris said that he had always been lucky, as he had gotten high-end equipment and skills right away, but now Hyung had shown him what it meant to be a true hero summoned. Now he knew to be kind with the weak and strong with the strong. He began coughing up blood and asked the leader to tell the healer his apologies. Shido told the two-handed healer that he could apologize to their comrade himself and then activated the great healing ability. The two-handed goddess saw the halo behind Shido's back and marveled that he was a master of divine skills. Chris came to his senses and saw the radiant leader. The one told him that he was kind to the weak as he himself had been a simple healer in the past. He asked the boy if he realized how important a healer was. After all, healing was the only way he could survive, and it was an extremely important skill, without which it was impossible to be in places like this. Afterwards, he suggested that Chris learn the skill himself, and the knight agreed. Then the young man asked what kind of halo was above Shido's head, and he replied that it was a halo. Chris wanted the same glowing ring, and the leader replied that he could get it, but first they needed to get out of the dungeon. On the way out of the dungeon, Shido told him that the halo could be obtained by mastering a divine skill such as healing or purification, but that you had to invest a hundred thousand points into the skill. The guy replied that he didn't have that amount and only had ten thousand. Shido suggested that Chris invest all the points in the patron's defense skill and then he would become stronger and he would have opportunities to earn even more points to further develop healing skills. The young man agreed and put all the points into the defense skill, leaving his place to save up points for when he meets his goddess. The player was enraged as her ward denied wanting to meet her and decided to become a healer. Lee Shido told Chris that his goddess would definitely be happy with this decision of his, because now he was definitely becoming a hero ready to protect people. But the two-handed player left him, just as she had once left the healer. Lee Shido and Chris moved further down the cave, and soon came to a crevice. The rascal informed her ward that something had happened and someone wanted to break into their channel, so she and the host were leaving the channel. Shido realized there was danger ahead, but Chris was already running ahead. When they went outside, they saw the fallen summoned one. 
His face and arm were completely covered in tattoos, which meant he had killed a great many summoners. He asked which one of them was the healer. Shido told Chris to step aside and decided to talk to the knight. The one replied that his patron had ordered him to destroy the healer using poisons. At that moment, the spearman heard a divine channel, joined by the warrior player. He channeled his new summon to take revenge on him. Shido realized he couldn't avoid the fight, but before they started fighting, he asked the fallen man how he knew where to find him. The guy then replied that there was nothing special about finding him, since the writing was already on the wall when he woke up. Why Shido didn't understand his opponent's answer, and asked him again, what did he mean by that? When the fallen man woke up, he saw an inscription on the wall that included the location of his victim as well as a kill assignment. Why Shido wondered why other players didn't leave their summoned inscriptions. The warrior stood up and said it was time to end the dialogue. Shido began to attack him, spraying poison and activating a vigilante stage. But he created a shield using mana and prevented the poison from getting to him. Shido then summoned a barrage of spears. The fallen man didn't have time to dodge and was hit by the blows. After using mana as a shield, he was very weak and the spearman was able to wound his arm. The warrior stood up, bleeding, and said that his previous victims were much weaker, but he wasn't going to lose to him. The player realized that the former healer was very strong, but still wanted revenge on him. Shido realized that the fallen man's strength was running low, because the warrior was producing a downfall and killing for him. This was exactly what Rascal had told him about, which was why the other players didn't leave messages for the summoned, so as not to create contact between them and take away the character's powers. The warrior asked the host how many times he had gone down in total, and the manager replied that it had happened 53 times, and the number was not recommended to be raised. However, the god decided that he could be present on the ground for three minutes, and that would be enough for him to kill the healer. Oni condescended down, taking his character's place. A pumped-up man with a red beard and braids appeared in front of Lai Shido. He summoned his hammer, which was behind the back of the spearman, and said that he would not allow the latter to carry his divine weapon. In his other hand he held the divine axe he had given the fallen man, and with which he had fought against Shido. Chris wanted to approach his friend, but the man shouted at him not to dare approach in any way. He then turned back to the player and said that there was no way he expected someone to dare to retaliate against him. The man attacked the spearman with his axe, and the latter was able to repel the blow. Lai Shido then mentally rolled the dice to inject poison into the axe, but lost. The warrior asked the guy if he was really willing to fight instead of just giving up, and the young man replied that he had nothing to lose. Then the man pressed the axe even harder, and the blade slipped off the spear shaft and into the enemy's shoulder. Shido began to spit up blood and tried to pull the axe out of his shoulder. The host reminded the warrior that the logic stage had reached 86, and he needed to get back as soon as possible. Then the guy asked him if he was really ready to leave without finishing him. The player bought the provocation, and hit the guy with a M. Jolnir. However, he couldn't take him down, as Chris used his goddess defense skill and formed a shield around his captain, then dragged him away. Shido thanked the guy, and while he had a small distance advantage, applied great healing. The warrior continued to fight the enemy, and soon the number of his presence in the dissension reached 100. He didn't notice how he missed the count, and wanting to kill the enemy, he himself was killed. He was torn apart, after which he disappeared. In his place appeared a fallen arrival, who hit his head on the ground and died. Why Shido received victory points, and also received negative logic points of minus 13. He thought about the fact that he needed to minimize his contact with Rascal so that he wouldn't end up like that fallen one. Chris was surprised that the patrons could go to their world with him, and Shido asked him to keep quiet about it and not tell anyone. Thoth made promises and asked the captain where the god might have disappeared to. The spearman lied that he thought that that patron had most likely returned to his world. He then suggested that they return to the village. When they arrived at the settlement, he ordered Chris to find the rest of their team while he went about his urgent business. Rascal made contact and began apologizing to her ward for leaving abruptly, as she feared she would get trouble from the warrior by her presence. The young man held no grudge against her and said that now she would not have to see the warrior since he had killed him. The girl asked him if he wondered what had become of the goddess. Shido was surprised as he thought she had left Chris, but Rascal replied that even leaving her character required a certain amount of points, which she didn't have. Shido was annoyed since with him, the traitorous girl didn't even think to spend for his benefit points. After the story, Rascal asked what the guy was going to do now. After being able to somewhat get revenge on the traitorous and kill the warrior, and the guy replied that he was going to accumulate a hundred thousand points again and return to his world. 
He went into one of the buildings on some business as suddenly Pierre, a priest of the order, appeared before him. He greeted the saint, saying that he was glad to see him again, and then said that he had come to him on behalf of the Holy Virgin. With him was a troop of several members of the troop, who bowed to the healer. Pierre reported that the holy maiden had told him that there was no secret inspector, but he understood Li Shido's lies. Song Yunha had told him everything, including that hands had absorbed Lik's core and almost caused hell in that village. Therefore, the order understood that Shido wanted to protect them in the eyes of the villagers and not tarnish their reputation and trust in them. Therefore, the holy maiden decided to truly give the title of saint to Lai Shido, and in that village, the villagers who were saved from the disease decided to put up a bronze statue for their hero. Lai Shido didn't argue about the fact that he had actually lied to them to escape until the situation escalated that day, and was shocked when he found out that they were putting up a statue in his honor, thinking it was unnecessary. Pierre asked him to be sent with them to meet the holy virgin to go through the ceremony for the title of saint. Lai Shido realized that he wouldn't be able to escape, so he went with the squad to the main building of the order. When they arrived at the palace, Yun Ha ran up to them and greeted the saint, expressing that she was very happy to see him again. As they walked down the corridor to meet the holy maiden, Yun Ha told her colleagues that the traveler who had arrived was the legendary hero saint who was able to single-handedly defeat the undead army. Everyone saluted and bowed at the sight of Lai Shido, and the latter felt awkward. When they approached the room where the Holy Maiden was, one of the guard knights asked Lai Shido to leave his weapons in the hallway and also not to step over the cloth that covered the maiden, as no one dared to look at her face. When Shido stepped inside, he stopped hearing any players. Then he heard two female voices simultaneously saying the same words. The maiden, hidden behind a curtain, greeted the hero and asked him to join her order so that they could do justice together. The young man accepted the offer and replied in agreement, after which he was escorted to his private room, where he could rest. At this moment, he heard the new players discussing amongst themselves that they were unable to get a proper look at the legendary hero. This meant that their channels were separated by the space of the earth, and when she left the maiden's room, they could no longer see him and were silent in the presence of her patroness. The maiden was just as summoned, moreover, still able to repeat word for word the phrases of her player. He did not understand who that maiden was or what connection she had to her player, but her silhouette seemed familiar. He then heard a few more new voices discussing that the great king, the patron saint maiden, had come up with the idea to use the saint hero to make war with the king of the northern wasteland. The northern wasteland was a place where outsiders were forbidden to enter, which meant that those lands were very dangerous. After hearing the gossip of the players, Lai Shido told Lime that they urgently needed to escape from the palace because he couldn't obediently follow someone who was hiding the purpose of his being in the order from him. The young man left the room, and as he was about to take his spear, which stood against the wall near the entrance, he heard someone ask him where he was going to escape to. He did not realize whether the voice belonged to a man or a god, and turned around, asking in response, who was in front of him. 